I, I think that's a good track, uh, Jack, um, because if you uh, if your goal is to be uh, the next Vince Scully, it's too narrow. Uh, I, I've had many young people in classes say, I, I want to be the next general manager of the Dodgers. There, and there's only one of those jobs. Uh, there's only 30 major league teams. So you need to broaden your scope as you are. And I would encourage you to continue to do that because all of those skills come together, whether it is uh, writing, uh, whether it is uh, production, uh, film production, or anything that falls in a creative basket, because that's really where you are. Uh, is all beneficial and you don't want to limit yourself in any of those areas because um, we can see that many people who advance uh, maybe even as, as an actor then later find themselves as a director a producer a whatever so i applaud you for that um, Grand Canyon, I once had a, a, a bit of a relationship with in that they were thinking of a, um, a sports management program uh, a number of years ago, oh, yeah. and maybe that has evolved. The other thing I think about Grand Canyon, I think I'm right from a baseball standpoint, both uh, Tim Solomon uh, and Chad Curtis uh, played at Grand Canyon, did they not? Correct. And uh, I once um, traded for uh, Chad uh, uh, somewhere in the mid 1990s, I think. Um, and he certainly had a, um, a sad downturn in life, did he not? Oh, yeah. Well, what, what, is, what do you know of him today? Is he in prison? I believe so, unfortunately. Yeah, he kind of went down a, a dark path. I don't know the, the, the details. I kind of don't go into it that much, but I, I know for certain that I don't think he's out right now. Yeah, that was very sad because he was a, um, a very competitive guy and, and actually had a couple of very good years with the Yankees um, after the time. I think I made the trade with... Uh, may have been with Detroit. I don't know for sure. I think it was with Detroit. And we picked him up as an extra outfielder. And um, I, I, I like the way he approached the game. Yeah. I mean, it's unfortunate, again, how kind of things turned out. But, like, again, kind of like as life moves on, you kind of have to, like, keep, I don't know, like in a way being inspired by something. Because, like, you see a lot of players who kind of, you know, step away from the game and they don't really have an identity in a sense, right? Like they kind of like, okay, like that's what I did for 20 years and now it's like, what am I going to do? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, uh, Jack, you, you can take this um, wherever uh, you want to go. It's, uh, it's your show and there's no questions. Uh, it's always been my philosophy. Um, uh, and as a journalist or that interest, you can understand this. My philosophy was always no questions are off limit uh, because the one answering the questions controls the subject. A lot of people don't understand that. Uh, and I used to tell my classes, no comment. I prefer not to comment at this time are legitimate answers. Right. To fabricate, to lie is the worst thing you can ever do in your life because you will suffer the greatest loss and that's credibility oh, yeah. and you can't get it back. So you always need to have that uh, in, in, um, in mind um, and never more important um, than it is in um, today's world as far as um, uh, being uh, truthful, being honest and uh, operating with uh, integrity. And that was kind of the the, uh, the first thing I kind of wanted to talk to you about, you know, because I, I listened to your interview with my good friend Alex Fuse on his uh, last interview segment, uh, which you guys can check out on all podcast platforms. But again, you were talking about credibility, like saying, like, if you lose it, it's really hard to get it back and 
pretty much impossible to get it back yep. because again, it's one of the more valuable things that you could possess in whether you're a professional or on a personal scale. Yep. So like with, with you saying that, are there, cause again, um, in, in your experience, were there times where uh, you lost the trust or, you know, I don't want to say respect of some but one, but like they lost their credibility in your eyes because they did something that was kind of demeaning or uh, just untrustworthy. Well, I've seen it. Uh, um, and uh, Jack, I mean, we, uh, we'll we just talk now and then you, you can, you know, edit or do whatever you need to do. So I, I just assume we're, you know, we're, we're, as you would on the air. Good to go. Uh, you know, uh, a time that really struck me was in the um, a significant uh, financial uh, crisis. Um, I, I don't know that I can pinpoint the year, but I remember the period where that was 2008 or, or what it was, where uh, the financial markets were in turmoil. And what struck me is that um, a, a lot of people um, were found uh, uh, guilty of charges against them uh, for um, for falsehoods, uh, if you would. And people who were lawyers and financial advisors, the one thing that struck me was quite often the answer was, "I knew it was wrong." Mm -hmm but I felt that I had to do it. Whether that was related to their income, their family, the pressures from the above. I think about it. I knew it was wrong, but I felt I had to do it. And that's a, um, uh, a severe uh, setback. And we've seen the same thing just within recent years with the parents and others, uh, including college administrators, who were involved in the uh, terrible situation of having uh, students, uh, sons, daughters, others, and from very influential and successful families get into a college because payments were being made. And uh, and now you, you, for the most part, hear and see the remorse of these people. And some of them even doing it without the awareness of their child, their son or their daughter. And you know, the most heartbreaking part of all of that is uh, it, if you can kind of project yourself into that uh, time, uh, time frame of that situation, a son or daughter uh, being uh, so dismayed and so disappointed in their parents who were trying to help, but doing it in the wrong way. So I think it's, um, I think it's just uh, so important. It's so basic, really. Most of us uh, know the difference between right or wrong. <laughs> the question becomes, how you handle the decision of right or wrong, where you're in situations where you might be able to benefit or help somebody else benefit. Oh yeah. I mean, to your credit, like the second you lose it, like they say that it takes 30 years to build a reputation and takes three seconds to lose it, you know, like, and, and we've seen like that, that exact example over the past few years. I know that there was one at, at USC just two, three years ago. Um, there were like, bribes going in or whatever when it came to uh enrolling you know someone's daughter i forget the actress's name enrolling her daughter but she um basically you know lied and base basically paid more money to allow her daughter to go to that school and it was a big scam and it yeah. just did not end up well for anybody right at, at the end of the day you get caught and you lose your respect your credibility and again like you just you don't come back from that easily. There's, there's very few people that you see uh, 
come back. And there, there are people like I'll use Alex Rodriguez as, as an example, you know, his entire uh, steroid scandal with everything, everybody's questioning his legitimate, you know, statistics in the game of baseball, one of the greatest hitters of all time. But after that and everything that went down behind it, all the, the, the details that went behind that, you look at it and you're like, okay, I can't look at him the same way. But at the same time, and I don't know what your um, take is on that, but I, I feel like he's done a decent job, you know, uh, coming back in the game in the public eye at least and kind of redeeming himself in a sense of like, yes, I, I, I'm, you know, I screwed up. I'm, I'm very, um, I'm going to hold myself accountable for the things that I did. I don't know what your take is on that. Well, no, I think that's uh, the, only, um, the only road back uh, is the road that should have been taken in the first place, yeah. strangely enough, and that's with honesty. But the only way back is to uh, acknowledge uh, uh, the wrong, not try to defend it, not try to make excuses, to acknowledge it, and then to try to uh, do what you can to assist in the uh, calls or a calls where you can be um, helpful to others and use your own uh, experience in a positive way. And, and, um, and, and those are uh, some admirable stories, despite the, the misdeed, uh, because we're all subject uh, vulnerable to misdeeds. Uh, but when made to acknowledge that and then to try to uh, be helpful to others and, and, and try to um, start a path to, um, uh, to rebuild uh, your own uh, life and credibility. But it's, it's, a, uh, it's a terrible loss yeah. uh, to lose it uh, without question. And, you know, you kind of, you starting out as a writer, kind of going through the ranks, you know, obviously positions changing, things changing, becoming general manager of the LA Dodgers, dealing with players and coaches and building relationships and networking with people all across the country and the league. You know, for you starting out, you know, dealing with all of these people, you mentioned credibility and how important it is to, you know, have the respect and have that certain level of, identity uh over the years did you ever feel you know like not necessarily pressure but uh in a sense of you know i have to deal with all of these people at the time there's a lot of pressure going on you know whether it's you know building relationships as a writer you know like it's kind of like a quote-unquote media member that's always tough you know media and, and players and coaches but at the same time as a general manager dealing with all of these different things wearing all of these different hats did you ever feel um, it, you know, there were certain days where it was just pressured in the sense of just like, okay, I have to like maintain focus here. And at the end of the day, do you feel like you did an overall solid job of, of attaining that credibility and respect over the years? I, I, uh, I never really felt uh, the pressure. I felt fortunate uh, in uh, growing up in a very small community, Jamestown, Ohio. Um, being um, blessed with wonderful parents, uh, uh, I never really um, felt the uh, the pressure of uh, uh, of doing quote, doing the the right thing. Mm -hmm. I just thought that um, it was um, the right thing, and um, I, I really feel that um, in terms of uh, whether you're successful. Uh, with that is not something that you can self-describe. It really comes from um, from others that you uh, that you uh, worked with. And I've now lived long enough to know the value of the uh, working relationships and the friendships and how. I always wanted to to deal with um, people, um, and in the most basic uh, sense, is 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 so simple, yeah. but so basic and so true. 
of treat others how you would like to be treated. And that sounds so, uh, so basic, right. but it is so true. And, um, and that's, that was always very um, important to me. And I think part of that is taking a, um, even when, when you are younger, taking a long range view of your own life because we never know how long life will be. So what it is we do today has uh, today has incredible impact on our life story and on our legacy. And we build that life story not by years. We 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 build it by days. Yeah. So um it's been very rewarding again. Uh, when you get to my age, and uh, uh, as is well documented, I'm 85 and feel very uh, fortunate and blessed to have relationships with people that I knew years ago um, and to um, see how those uh, relationships have evolved through the years. You you want to be comfortable with those. Yeah. You, you, you want to know that um, that you've given your your best and that you've tried to deal with each relationship uh, with transparency, with integrity, and with um, with honesty. And, and you know, uh, we we don't always uh, achieve those things as much as we try. Yeah. But if we have those as our foundation, um, then then we've. Um, We've got a chance for um, uh, for lifelong relationships. Well, let me ask you this, just to play devil's advocate for a second. You were talking about earlier, like still based on you know credibility. You know, you're, you're giving the example of someone you know knowing that it was wrong in a sense, but they felt like they had to do it, whether it was you know like a financial situation. You have to put food on the table for your family, you know, your wife, your kids, whatever it is. Um, Throughout your experience, was there ever, you know, that proverbial, you know, carrot being dangled in front of you in a sense of like, okay, like this is wrong, but it's kind of tempting to go down this route in order to like solve some problems. But at the end of the day, of course, you, you do the right thing. Because at the end of the day, if you do the right thing, everything will work itself out. Like in the moment, things might sting, things might be hard if there's certain tough situations. But at the end of the day, it'll always work itself out. But did you ever have a situation, whether it was as a writer, as a general manager, dealing with all of these different situations, did you ever have a situation where you were like, I could go down this road, but I'm not going to? Well, I um, one of the situations um, played out in a very visible way, uh, and that is when um, Fox uh, took over ownership of the Dodgers. Mm -hmm. And um, at the very beginning, in their first year, in their first few months, Fox bought the Dodgers because they were interested in the Southern California television rights. Yeah. And then as they continued to expand, they were also interested in the Florida television rights uh, uh, in, the, uh, in, in the Florida uh, area. And, uh, and the Marlins were a, um, an important part of that. And so as they were negotiating, and it later learned about that um, uh, deal with the Marlins, the Marlins were kind of hamstrung with their financial situation, trying to figure everything out because they had some rather significant contracts with uh, Bobby Bonilla and uh, Gary Sheffield, among others. And Fox um, said, uh, uh, as it as later revealed, well, we, we can handle those uh, contracts for you. We'll, we'll take those players and we'll get, and we'll trade you Mike Piazza, who's a free agent at the end of the year. So you have zero uh, obligation after that year. And they basically, and this is pretty well documented in my book, Fred Clare, My 30 Years in Dodger Blue. They basically came to me and said, Fred, um, we want you to say that you made this trade. So now, uh, I didn't really analyze it as such, but my instincts certainly led me to believe that 
uh, I either did this uh, or um, I would pay a price for it because this is what the ownership was asking me to do. And um, my answer was, um, you got the wrong guy here. If you think I'm going to go before the um, uh, public, before the media, uh, and then the public and lie about the situation, it's not going to happen. And so when the press conference was ultimately held, I was very candid, as the record shows, of how this trade uh, came about. I remember a day after the press conference, a writer who was well tuned in to the television industry also said, Fred, they're going to get you. They are so pissed at you. They are going to get you. And, um, and indeed, they did. But, uh, Jack, I never um, really uh, looked back, even though it cost me my job uh, at an uh, important time in my career. Uh, I would do the same thing uh, today. I would do the same thing any day. So I think it's, um, I just knew two things. I knew that it was the wrong thing to do. Yeah, I didn't really have to um, think about it. A again, um, I, I know right from wrong. And um, so I made that decision and um, Fox in turn um, fired me. Uh, and uh, I've never regretted uh, that decision in any way. I, I felt that um, I wasn't... Um, devastated by it because you, you shouldn't be devastated if you're doing the right thing regardless of what the price is and I knew that uh, now I um, it was time after 30 years with the Dodgers uh, to move on with my life and to move on with other things so uh, temptation is always going to be there uh, for all of us uh, and uh, and the decisions we make determine who we are I mean, that's a crazy, you know, story and ending for you after, again, 30 years, a 30-year tenure in the way that it ends like that. And you going on record and saying, if I could do it all over again, I wouldn't change a thing. Like, that, that no. speaks to your integrity. What, you know, everybody, you know, learns from their mistakes early on in life, whether it's, you know, little things or big things. Was that, you know, when it, when it comes to, you know, your integrity and your credibility in that sense, like you weren't going to go on record and lie. Has that always been like your moral compass? Was that always a moral value for you from the get-go? Or was there like an early on experience, whether it was in like grade school, you know, something stupid, like you lied to your mom or something. Was there like something that you, you know, learned from and you were like, oh, that kind of stings. That doesn't feel good. Like why, why would anybody want to lie? No, I, again, I think it was um, uh, being fortunate um, to be raised in a, uh, in a good environment. Yeah. Um, but uh, I never thought of it in terms that, um, that uh, look, that um, I want to be remembered for this or anything related to uh, honesty or integrity or anything else. I think that's a reach for anyone to self-describe. I would not be comfortable uh, with that. Um, a recent, uh, uh, podcast um, by someone you know, our mutual friend Alex. Um, he uh, asked me, um, I believe, um, the words were, um, what do you want to be remembered for? Mm -hmm. And um, my answer was, I want to be remembered for doing the best that I could. And uh, I apply that to my career. I apply that to um, uh, to uh, anything that I ever did competing in sports. Uh, and uh, I must say that um, I certainly didn't always succeed. And in fact, when I think about it in a very important way, I uh, know that I was not the student in uh, high school that I should have been. 
I know that I could have been better. I know that I didn't give my best. And it became in full realization once I got into uh, college and um, got into a four-year college and survived the second year of a junior college, more interested in basketball and playing basketball than going to the, uh, than in the classroom. But what I discovered was that I was the best student that I had ever been in my last two years of college because it came to the realization, I better, I better get moving. Yeah. Uh, time is running out. No, no one had to tell me. I, I understood. But when I think about that, I think about and wonder and know I could have been a much better student in high school than I was. And I certainly don't say that with any pride because that was a lack of giving the mm -hmm. best that I had to give. So sometimes we can get off track with our, with our focus on what we should be uh, doing. And, and, um, and we see that uh, throughout our lives. We may have the motto, I say, I want to be known for giving my best. Well, th there, there were times um, in areas of my life uh, where I, uh, I fell short, that I may have been giving too much over here and not enough over here. And then looking back, realizing that what was over here was more important than what I was doing over there. Mm -hmm. so I think those are life lessons. I mean, that, again, that kind of like alludes to, you know, having passion for something. Like when it comes to schoolwork, I, I would say that I'm in the same boat, like not necessarily have a passion for it, but I know I got to get it done in order to, you know, get to where I want to be in a sense, right? Like you, you saying that, you know, you were more kind of focused, like wanting to be a basketball player at that point, as opposed to, you know, getting your schoolwork done and having like your grades to a point where it's just like, okay, like this is good. But at the same time, you're kind of like, like looking back at it now, you're like, man, I kind of wish I worked on that could it, could you know, it, a little have, bit more. Yeah, could it could have done better. And um, and we um, quite often the important influencing factors. I, my first year of junior college, um, I had a very good year. I was interested in journalism. I had a wonderful uh, instructor at the uh, junior college level, and he uh, and that was a good year. He really. Um, inspired me um, uh, and then you know and then we have to get uh, we have to get back on track yeah and you know after that you know you're 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 kind of like being you know like you said guided in a sense like you're struggling in one area and you you, you find help you find a way to get it done and then you know as time evolves you you know, just to, again, kind of switching gears a little bit into the book, because obviously uh, your new book, Extra Innings, Fred Clare's Journey to the City of Hope and Finding a World Championship Team. You know, you starting out as a sports writer, and we were talking about it before we, you know, you jumped on when we first jumped on Zoom, you know, like having options in a sense, you know, like in, in my life personally, like I grew up in northern New Jersey, right outside Manhattan. There's a ton of people who are like, yeah, I want to be the broadcaster of the New York Yankees. But like you're limiting yourself if you're if you're saying like that's the only thing you want to accomplish because there's so many other people in line like you know Michael Kay broadcaster for the Yankees on the Yes Network has been there for 25 to 30 years you know like those guys aren't leaving anytime soon John Sterling was still on the air for the past 35 40 years you know like if you're limiting yourself to those aspirations you're not going to end up not necessarily fulfilled in the end but you're not going to end up happy in the end so for you yeah. you know starting out you know as a writer i i'm sure you, it kind of you know took a turn for you when you look back at it saying like i was general manager for the dodgers i had a 30-year tenure i was a world series champion i developed all of these relationships uh kind of give like a, a quick summary as, as to like what the book alludes to because like you said you know uh, 85 years strong everything that you've been through whether it was professionally personally you know battling illness uh, what do you take away from this book and what inspired you to write it on, on a personal level?
So the reason for the uh, the book and that I was in agreement to do the book uh, was that uh, a way to uh, shine a light on this great uh, medical center uh, and how it had impacted my life uh, and so many lives. Yeah. And uh, uh, but I um, uh, I was very fortunate. The author book Tim Madigan did a wonderful job in weaving the story uh, of my baseball career uh, with the uh, City of Hope and uh, my feeling about uh, having been very fortunate to be with the Dodgers under the O'Malley ownership and being a part of really a, um, a, a well-run and acknowledged baseball franchise. And, uh, and then to see the City of Hope and uh, the leadership of the City of Hope and how they uh, went about uh, uh, their work uh, in helping patients. So that really was the, the theme. And I've been so pleased uh, with the reviews of the book on Amazon because they basically say two things that were very important to me at the outset. Uh, because I said to the author, this, this can't be a Fred book. That book was written a number of years ago. Yeah. But when I look at the reviews and I see the people, in fact, one was posted just today. Uh, City of Hope must be quite a place. And Cheryl, Fred's wife, must be quite a caregiver. Because for any patient, I don't care where you are, the medical people that you're dealing with and the support that you have from friends and family are the two most important uh, parts in any recovery. And uh, in many ways, they're equally important because you have to have the support. This is not a, uh, this is not a one person, one patient uh, journey. Yeah. And, uh, uh, or, or if it is, it's made very difficult if you don't have the support. So th th that was the reason um, uh, for the book. And I think the, um, uh, again, the author, Tim Madigan, does a good job in terms of, of, of weaving that story uh, and uh, the things that I dealt with in my career in taking over as the Dodger general manager during a very difficult time. And then um, having um, come off two very down seasons, 1986, 1987, and then winning the World Series. But the most important part of that, uh, that the book uh, was able to tell the story, is that winning the World Series is a team effort. It is not a general manager effort. It is not just a manager's effort. It is not a star player's effort. It is a team effort. Yeah. And that's what a great medical facility is all about. And that's what I saw so vividly saw at a very early stage of my treatment. Oh, wow. I'm, I'm, I'm involved in one heck of a team right here. I, I, I can look around and see not just me, I can see how all patients are being treated that I can be aware of and thinking, um, this is something special. Yeah. Were there, you know, uh, other experiences where you didn't feel that way, whether it was about, you know, like uh, you talk about the City of Hope, whether it was hospitals or other organizations where like this one really stood out to you, like you were insanely inspired by it? Well, it's the most inspirational uh, experience. I mean, uh, certainly um, through the years of being um, with the Dodgers and um, and and recognizing uh, well-run uh, organizations, successful organizations. And there's a very important book students have asked me um, about books related to um, a career in sports. And I mentioned a book. And the only person mentioned in the book 
a sports person uh, happens to be, it was a friend of mine, and that was Coach John Wooden. The book is Good to Great, and the book really has to do an examination of companies. What is it that separates companies? Why do some achieve a level of greatness? Uh, the book by Jim Collins and his study group from Stanford talks about what it is that makes a great organization. And we can be talking about a television network. Yeah. We can be talking about a baseball team. We can be talking about a grocery chain. It really doesn't matter. But there are common denominators that are involved in reaching a level of greatness. And I recommend that book because of some of the things that it talks about, and uh, many of them really like uh, a life cycle, if you read it, about the flywheel concept of day after day, just continuing to make movement. And then ultimately, you look back and you see you've traveled a long road. Um, the hedgehog concept of just working so hard. And one of the most important relates to uh, being part of a team with the terminology, you have to get the right people on the bus. Right. You have to have right. leadership. And then you have to have that leadership philosophy. And then you have to have the right people on the bus in terms of the team. And when you see that, and, and quite often, the, uh, the leader of uh, the successful companies are not the people that you're always seeing on television, not the most vocal right. people, not the people right. who seem to be uh, self-promoting in many ways to a de great degree or almost making themselves bigger than the team. It is the stability. It is the ability to bring a group of people together. That is what a leader is. It is not a... Uh, the greatest component is that individual's ability to bring people uh, together. And I saw that um, uh, with the Dodgers and under the O'Malley uh, ownership. I've certainly seen that with the City of Hope and the president and CEO, Robert Stone, and some of the great uh, medical doctors, Dr. Foreman, Dr. Rosen, and others who are truly leaders who uh, care about the, um, the people on their team. And when there's success, don't talk about their accomplishments. Talk about the team accomplishments. That's important. And you, you were alluding to it, you know, having the, the right people on the bus per se. You're talking about some of the people, you know, behind the scenes who probably deserve way more credit than they're actually getting, whether it's in an organization, you know, in a hospital, in a business, whatever field of work you're in, you know. Um, how early on did you discover, like, knowing that, okay, in order for me to succeed, you know, it's, it's a team effort. You can't do it all alone. You can get to a certain amount of success, a certain level of, of success, on your own, but you're going to limit yourself eventually. Like you need a, a, a team, like a unit, you know, a stable of people who are like-minded, you know, everybody thinks differently, but you know, there's some people that just get it in a sense. Like how, how long did it take you to discover uh, in that sense? Like I need to be surrounded by people who know what it takes to get to this, you know, specific goal in a sense. Well, with the Dodgers, I was very fortunate in that from a baseball standpoint, when I became the general manager in 1987, I had been with the Dodgers for nearly uh, 20 years. Yeah. So I knew the ownership, I knew the leadership, I knew all of the scouts, I knew all the people in player development. Uh, I knew at the time that I joined the team, Walter Austin and his coaches and a young minor league manager who was coming up by the name of Tommy Lasorda. So one of the reasons why I had no real fear is that one thing I knew for sure, I was surrounded by great people. And I knew that 
if I relied on them for guidance and in making decisions, we had a very good chance to succeed. Yeah. Because they had already established themselves time and time again as people who were uh, proven in their roles and who uh, uh, I knew uh, personally uh, and had seen how dedicated they were. So I had uh, absolutely uh, no fear whatsoever because I knew that if I called upon them uh, and that was going to be the main driver of everything that I did, to call upon the people around me who had the experience, who were proven, then to make the decision, decisions that had to be made. And the other part of that is that um, uh, take responsibility for the decision. So um, everyone um, understood, even from uh, the outset, um, that uh, this was going to be the way that we would operate. Yeah, and you're dealing with so many different personalities. Like you said, like some people aren't necessarily wired differently, but everybody has their own opinions. Everybody's got to come together and make decisions. And, you know, it's well documented just looking at it from an outsider's perspective, you know, you and, and Tommy Lasorda, totally different personalities, totally different, at, at, like at totally different ends of the spectrum in a sense, you know, you, winning a World Series title together after two very big down years, like you said, you said in 86 and 87, you know, looking back at it now, because again, unfortunately, he did just pass away a number of weeks ago, you know, going on, you know, 50 plus years of, you know, knowing the guy, having a relationship with the guy, what can you take away from your overall relationship with Tommy Lasorda? Well, I treasure a, um, a 51 year, uh, 52 year uh, friendship. Um, and, uh, uh, and, uh, and and our uh, journey uh, together from first meeting Tommy in uh, 1969 when I was still a writer and becoming very good friends immediately. And those years with the Dodgers and Tommy advancing and becoming a coach and then the manager uh, and uh, the development of our friendship and then ultimately um, becoming the general manager and working uh, directly with Tommy in that capacity of decision making. And that's those are roles, general manager, manager, uh, head NFL coach and general manager, where um, your uh, key components in the decisions and your uh, uh, thoughts aren't always going to agree in terms of what we do, how do we get better. Uh, but the thing with Tommy, uh, where we had the uh, the common bonds were um, being very competitive uh, and a great love for the Dodgers. And knowing that whatever might happen um, in a meeting, once the decision was made to come out and to be uh, together. So, uh, it was a, um, uh, Tommy was um, uh, just a tremendous uh, personality uh, who had a great passion uh, for his family, for the Dodgers, for baseball. So I, um, I have great um, memories of, uh, of that and, uh, and our um, relationship and getting to a, a point then as life life cycle goes on, uh, to know that um, uh, time uh, was running short. By the very title of um, the book on my cancer journey, Extra Innings, and Tommy having gone through challenging periods. But his passion for life and his desire for life uh, never ended. And in one of our last conversations, he said, Fred, he says, my goal is to hit 100. I want to be 100 years old. And I said, tell me, no, no one can be rooting for you or praying for you more than, 
than I am. So we had that bond. And I think the important part of that is that as we look at relationships that go through years and to go through very close uh, associations, how do we how do we want to remember all of that? How do we want to be remembered in all of that? And I think that uh, it's so important uh, to do everything you can to let people know uh, that you care about them and that your thoughts are are with them. And particularly in these times of such challenging times. Right. And uh, Cheryl and I called. Um, Many people who've suffered um, losses, a uh, uh, former scout who passed away and calling his wife quite often to see how she's doing, not forgetting uh, the people in our lives. Oh, yeah. And, you know, like you said, with everything in this book, Extra Innings, you know, uh, talking about your, your experience going through what you, you recently went through, uh, among other things, you know, like we said, 85 years strong everybody's constantly searching for, you know, that inspiration, that, that spark plug that results in them starting their next project or their next journey in life, you know, that next chapter. Uh, given your experience and everything, like how, what, what are some of the specific, you know, inspirations that you've had along the way? Like you said, like uh, mentioning, like developing these relationships, you know, telling everybody more often than we probably do, unfortunately, that, you know, you love them, you, you, you care for them, you support them. How are, like, what are some of the specific, you know, inspirations that you've had in your life that have led to those next chapters and those next journeys that you've had? Well, I think in uh, uh, having been uh, so fortunate to uh, be around uh, people who uh, have made a, a great impact in the uh, in the life of others. And uh, I think of, um, I'll go back to Coach Wooden, uh, throughout all of his life, 90 plus years, with a basic keynote of make each day your masterpiece. Yeah. And to um, look at, uh, at other uh, lives, there was a, a well-known uh, dancer who passed away recently. Uh, who was in her 90s, and reading the New York Times, she said that, uh, you know, in life, you need to look at each decade, not for what you have lost, because we're all going to lose certain parts of our life, mm -hmm. but for what you have gained. Those things become uh, inspirational for me, and um, and at a foundation, uh, and I've used this in conjunction with the City of Hope, uh, is the inspirational story of, uh, of Jackie Robinson and a uh, very uh, well-known uh, statement, quote, that reflects Jackie's thoughts in life. And that is, a life is not important except in the impact it has on other lives. I use that quote, certainly not thinking of myself at all. I use that life in thinking of the city of hope and the way that each and every day, the people there, the doctors, the staff, the nurses, the volunteers impact other lives. Those things become uh, very, uh, they are uh, inspirational to me. Sometimes someone can be an inspiration and, and, and never talk and try to talk in an inspirational way. Uh, the wonderful Roy Campanella was an example of that. Roy Campanella went from a major league star player in one night of an automobile accident to spending the rest of his life in a wheelchair. I never heard Roy talk in inspirational terms. I just saw how he handled his life. And it was inspiring, inspiring to know that, uh, at least uh, from someone not in the immediate family, but on the outside, who, um, who never cursed his flame, uh, 
fate, who never talked about what might have been. Uh, so sometimes it's, um, it's an example uh, set without words. And, uh, but those are, the, um, those are the inspirational uh, people. The, um, uh, the wonderful Vin Scully has been an inspiration uh, to me and to thousands and to millions about the way that he uh, performed uh, each day with his responsibilities and being so talented, so acknowledged, but I saw it firsthand, giving the best he had to give every day and doing so with intelligence, doing so with a passion and doing so in caring for other people. And he and Tommy were somewhat alike in that regard. <laughs> I was with them I don't know, hundreds, thousands of days. I never saw them ever refuse to give an autograph. I never saw them refuse to acknowledge someone. Uh, they were legendary figures uh, who, uh, and, and Vinny is a legendary figure, who has never gotten lost in his um, own legend. His, his kindness towards others is an inspiration. So th those are, um, and I've been very fortunate, but we can find inspiration in so many people. Uh, go to City of Hope, and there are volunteers there. And one gentleman who's there who had lost his wife to cancer, but wanted to be at City of Hope to help others without any acclaim, without any fame, the, uh, those are the inspirational people to me. Yeah, it's amazing to see how some people's minds work in the sense of like, okay, you went through some of these tragedies, like to allude back to the story about Roy that you were talking about, you know, spending the rest of his life in a wheelchair. He could have been very bitter about it. I think we've seen, it's been well documented, a lot of veterans out there who, who you know, uh, are out of service and, you know, they can't uh, do certain things that they used to be able to and they're very bitter. They're very angry in a sense, which in a lot of ways you can look at and say they should be. But there's other people who take that and say, you know what, it, it happened. You know, there's a lot of positives that can come out of this. So there's already been a lot of positives in my life. There's really no sense of being, you know, bitter or angry about it. And to your credit about, you know, Tommy Lasorda and the Vin Scullys of the world, like those guys, true, you know, visionaries, and they have true passion for what they do. You know, they, they love showing up to work every day. They were in it for, for the players, the coaching staff, more so the fans more than anything else that you were alluding to. And I, I was talking about earlier, you know, you wearing, you know, multiple different hats, whether it's as a writer or as a GM, you're doing a million different things. When it comes to, you know, wearing multiple different hats, I feel like with emotions, it's very important to, to look at and say like, yes, like I could have been angry in this situation, but I wasn't, you know, so, some people are, some people react differently. Others are wired differently. How do you, like looking back at it now, like when it comes to, you know, dealing with frustrating times or dealing with great times, like when it comes to being, uh, you know, emotionally stable during all of those times, do you ever look back and say, man, I wish I reacted a different way looking back at it now in any given situation? Well, I, um, uh, I've uh, lived long enough uh, to know, and having um, been through a, um, a very uh, serious episode uh, with cancer, where they have cut my throat uh, twice to remove cancer from my face, I think that um, uh, it's um, just the recognition of the uh, blessing of life. And, um, and again, being um, inspired by people who have faced and continue to face such uh, great challenges in their lives. Uh, people who were born with a, a, a significant uh, handicap. And uh, so I, um, no, I, I think that um, we need to, um, to recognize 
at all ages and stages, if we can slow down enough at certain ages and stages to realize uh, how fortunate uh, we are and the, um, and the blessing of life. And, uh, and sometimes that doesn't come into full view until um, a, a life uh, is threatened. And, um, and again, that can come uh, at, at any age. But I think it's just a, um, uh, an appreciation and being um, realizing uh, how fortunate we are. And no matter uh, in, uh, in where we are, uh, to do um, what we can to uh, to assist uh, others, so that that's my um, uh, th that that's my um, main theme, and um, and one where I'm fortunate to um, be able to um, continue to be active, um, to do what I can uh, in terms of City of Hope, to do what I can in terms of um, encouraging um, young people uh, like yourself. Uh, Particularly those, because that's where my background is in the um, uh, the world of the business of sports. To know uh, how fortunate we are to uh, to have an opportunity, uh, and to um, to know that we need to give our best. And it's well appreciated, and I think that I speak on behalf of everybody that reaches out to you and wants to pick your brain about certain aspects. But again, you were talking about you know having to go through not necessarily a tragedy, but kind of an eye-opening experience to realize, oh my God, like I probably should take a step back and realize how much I've done, how many people care about me, how many people I care about, you know, the value of life in a sense. Do you feel like you need to go through something? Um, I mean, I feel like everybody needs to, needs to go through something bad, like dark times in order to, you know, grow as a human being and, um, you know, in, in a way, look back and say, yeah, like I'm taking a lot of this for granted. But do you feel like people need to go through a tragedy in order to I, look at it that way? Well, I would hope not. I, I, um, I, I have always um, tried to think about uh, looking forward. Uh, I think that's very important to, uh, uh, to be um, thinking about uh, uh, the future and planning for the future. I think it's um, uh, a bit of a mistake to kind of be at almost at any age to look back and think about, well, I've done this or I've done that, and to uh, really think about or dwell or display anything that may have come your way. Because if you are looking backwards to what you may have done, uh, you have a right to um, feel good about accomplishments at any stage, but it's a mistake to look back that way. I'm much more interested in uh, in uh, in looking forward, and um, I, th I think that's the um, I think that's the view uh, to have. And even when you are faced with a significant challenge. It becomes even more important to be looking forward um, and planning uh, for the future. So um, that that's where my uh, eyesight is. I'll, I'll look at the rear view mirror uh, to make sure that I haven't um, uh, uh, done anything wrong from what's been behind me but I'm much more interested in the forward view and that's where I am today. Yeah. I mean, you can't change the past at the end of the day, regardless of how, how you feel about it, it's there and there's no way to change it in a sense. You kind of have to look forward. And I feel like a lot of people today, unfortunately don't see it that way. There's a lot of people that do. And a lot of people that have life experiences to where they say like, okay, like I get it now. Like yeah, you have to move forward with 
with your life. And, and you talk about some of the, the, the personal stuff that you had to go through as well. Some of the, you know, professional stuff that you had to go through, you know, as general manager dealing with all of these different, you know, uh, the athletes and contracts and, and, and wearing all of those different hats, like I was alluding to before. I, I wanted to talk because again, the forward of, of, of your book, Extra Innings, you guys like right off the bat, start the book off with a bang, right? So the book you know, it, it tells certain stories. And one that I found particularly very interesting was your relationship with Kurt Gibson, because he wanted to leave, you know, like he, he felt that it was, you know, like he didn't feel safe living in Los Angeles anymore. He wanted to leave. And he felt like you weren't doing your job as a general manager. And it, it comes back to my point about, you know, feeling, you know, your emotions, you know, like you have to, you know, check certain emotions at the door. What was the whole story, you know, behind that, like him wanting to leave, you know, you guys kind of getting into it a little bit and how do you feel like your relationship has grown from everything that you guys have gone through? Well, Kirk and I certainly have had a, uh, a long um, and really what I would term a great relationship because what Kirk brought to the Dodgers, of course, in 88 uh, is a significant part of Dodger history and baseball history. But um, in uh, a, a year later, and uh, Kirk being a Michigan guy and Midwest guy, and being in Los Angeles, and some things that were concerning to him regarding the safety of his family, he was very concerned about that. And um, uh, I had a little scouting report on Kirk that uh, was kind of who Kirk is that I knew from. Uh, few others close to Kirk that he, along the way, uh, will challenge people. That's part of who Kirk is, whether it's an opposing player or whatever it may be, and trying to accomplish what he wants to accomplish. So he had asked to be traded, and um, he uh, felt, uh, I believe this was the year after he won, I believe this was uh, 1989, yeah. and uh, had uh, made that request to me. Uh, and I told him that Kirk, I respected his request, and I would do what I could, but uh, my obligation was to the Los Angeles Dodgers. And so the Sunday before the All-Star game that year, uh, we got into um, what turned out to be quite a screaming match, as well documented by those who were in the clubhouse, uh, because Kirk felt that I wasn't doing my job and not trading him, and uh, I didn't appreciate the fact that he was judging me on how I did my job. I didn't judge him on how he did his job. And, uh, but what I really remember is when play resumed after that Sunday after the All-Star game, Kirk and I, we uh, went, opened up the second half in Chicago. And Kirk and I uh, met in the clubbies room in, uh, in Wrigley Field a very close quarters right. in picture and know of Wrigley Field. And uh, I told him, I said, Kirk, uh, it's a good thing you got a mild-mannered agent because I said, you got a hell of a temper. And he said, Fred, don't tell me about my temper. He said, when you put your glasses on the top of your head and, and got in my face, don't tell me about my temper. And we both kind of smiled. I said, okay. And uh, I said, Kirk, I, I understand and I will do what I can. And he said, Fred, he said, I know that. And I want you to know other, one other thing. I will do my best as long as I wear a Dodger uniform. I said, Kirk, of that, I have no doubt. So that was our relationship. He ultimately left after three years as a free agent. I remember Kansas City, Kirk Robinson, the general manager, called me and said, Fred, what do you think? I said, Hurt. I would sign him as it can be one of the greatest influences on a club that I've ever seen. And few have been more supportive in my cancer journey than Kirk. So I guess really the story of that, as we discussed earlier, is that you can have differences along the way. And particularly if you're passionate about what you do. And you should be, and you better be passionate about what you do you're going to be successful. But if you develop a mutual respect, and we did, and those friendships endure, 
And I'll never forget a recent call of uh, my phone rang. It was mid morning. He said, Freddie says, I'm just going into a uh, school here to speak. And I was just thinking about you and I want to know how you're doing. I said, Kirk, I'm, I really appreciate your call. I'm doing fine. One of any number of calls or texts. And not because it's Kirk Gibson, a famous player, but because it's a, a friend and uh, at a time that we spent together that was important to us in our lives. It doesn't have to be Major League Baseball. It could be any field. It could be any area. But uh, to have uh, friendships that are everlasting uh, is one of the real values of life. And the only way, in my view, that you create those gets back to Jack to what we talked about originally is through honesty yep. and transparency. And if we maintain those with uh, friends, with family, we will, I can assure you from my experience, benefit by those. So uh, I appreci appreciate uh, that friendship. And I appreciate Jack for giving me the opportunity to cover um, uh, some past uh, years and experiences and for the um, uh, wonderful plug that you've um, uh, given to uh, uh, our book, uh, All Net Proceeds to um, City of Hope, uh, Extra Innings, Fred Clare's Journey to City of Hope, and Finding a, um, a World Championship Team. And uh, wonderful to see um, Tommy on this cover as a uh, as a world champion uh, managed trust. So I really appreciate um, the time for the uh, promotion of the book. Well, I I'm gracious enough for you to you know I mean thank you for being gracious enough to take you know this last hour. Uh, of your time with me. I could ask you questions all day, but I promise I won't. I will let you get back uh, to your life. But Fred, thank you again so much. Uh, I hope great success comes with the book. Again, Extra Innings. It's available on Amazon right now. And uh, I hope you stay safe during these very, very weird times. Because again, we really don't know when it's going to be over. So no. uh, thank now. you. And um, anytime I can be of help, re reach out, Jack. Look forward to um, seeing your uh, career uh, advance. So uh, take good care and we'll stay in touch. Well, thank you very much, Fred. You bet.